Hello everyone, I am Dr. Prashant and in this presentation we will talk about pulmonary thromboembolism. Pulmonary thromboembolism occurs when an embolus from a systemic source finds its way to the pulmonary vasculature resulting in various clinical manifestations. It may cause right ventricular dysfunction, right ventricular microinfarction and pulmonary hypertension and also increased alveolar arterial gradient, impaired gas exchange due to increased dead space, alveolar hyperventilation due to stimulation of irritant receptors, increased airway resistance due to constriction of airways distal to the bronchi, and decreased pulmonary compliance due to lung edema. The etiology of venous thromboembolism may include procoagulant states due to genetic mutations such as the factor V Leiden mutation and prothrombin gene mutations. Antiphospholipid syndrome is the most common cause of acquired thrombophilia. There could also be predisposing factors such as malignancy, obesity, cigarette smoking, systemic hypertension, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, long haul air travel, oral contraceptive pills and hormone replacement therapy, surgery, air pollution, blood transfusion and sedentary lifestyle. The clinical features of pulmonary thromboembolism may be subtle in that pulmonary thromboembolism has been called the great masquerader because of signs and symptoms being non-specific, making the diagnosis difficult. The most common symptom is unexplained breathlessness along with sinus tachycardia. The patient may also present with features of overt heart failure and lack of clinical improvement during treatment for pneumonia or heart failure may be a clue. Pulmonary thromboembolism may be classified as massive when there is extensive thrombosis affecting at least half of the pulmonary vasculature and such patients would present as cardiogenic shock and the patient can die from multi-organ dysfunction. In submassive PE, there is RV dysfunction despite normal systemic arterial pressure. Patients with low risk PE have an excellent prognosis. The clinical likelihood of pulmonary embolism may be calculated based on the Wells Point Score system, a score which is slightly different from the Wells Score for DVT. The clinical variables include signs and symptoms of DVT which carries 3 points and alternative diagnosis less likely than PTE which carries 3 points as well. We also have heart rate more than 100, immobilization for more than 3 days or surgery in less than 4 weeks and prior pulmonary embolism or DVT all carry 1.5 points. Finally, hemoptysis and cancer carry 1 point each. A score of more than 4 indicates a high likelihood of pulmonary embolism. The differential diagnosis of pulmonary thromboembolism includes pneumonia, asthma and COPD, congestive heart failure, pericarditis, pleurisy and costochondritis, rib fracture and pneumothorax, acute coronary syndrome and anxiety. The diagnosis of pulmonary embolism may be established based on non-imaging diagnostic tests or imaging modalities. The imaging modalities may be non-invasive or invasive. The non-imaging diagnostic tests for pulmonary thromboembolism include D-dimer, cardiac biomarkers and electrocardiogram. D-dimer increases because fibrin is broken down by plasmin and is 95% sensitive for pulmonary thromboembolism. A negative D-dimer rules out PTE because of its high negative predictive value. However, in patients with myocardial infarction, pneumonia, sepsis, cancer and the post-operative state, D-dimer may be elevated. Therefore, it is of limited usefulness in hospitalized patients. Cardiac biomarkers such as serum troponin and and plasma heart type fatty acid binding protein may increase due to RV microinfarction. The electrocardiogram would show features of sinus tachycardia, right ventricular strain and ischemia, and T wave inversion in V1 to V4. An often quoted feature of pulmonary thromboembolism is the S1Q3 T3 pattern seen in 10 to 15% of the individuals. This is the schematic diagram of leads 1 and 3. The S wave in lead 1 the Q wave in lead 3 and the T wave inversion in lead 3 comprises the S1Q3 T3 pattern. The imaging modalities for diagnosis of pulmonary thromboembolism may be non-invasive and these include venous ultrasound, chest x-ray, chest CT, lung scanning, contrast MRI and 2D echocardiogram. The invasive modalities include pulmonary angiography and contrast phlebography. Venous ultrasound is based on the principle that a normal vein readily collapses, creating an illusion of a wink. Loss of compressibility 
is specific for deep vein thrombosis. The thrombus may also be directly visualized and venous flow dynamics can be examined using Doppler. The chest x-ray in pulmonary thromboembolism may be normal but it may also show focal oligemia and this is called the Westermark sign. Peripheral wedge-shaped densities at the pleural base is called the Hampton sign and enlarged right descending pulmonary artery is called the Pallas sign. Computed tomography pulmonary angiography is the principal imaging test for pulmonary thromboembolism in which sixth order branches and a four chamber view of the heart can be visualized. Pneumonia, fibrosis and pulmonary mass can be discerned as well and a triple rule out CT uses ECG synchronized acquisition wherein the three most common causes of chest pain pulmonary thromboembolism, aortic pathology and acute coronary syndrome can be ruled out. Lung scanning is the second line test for PTE and is used for those who cannot tolerate IV contrast. Albumin particles with gamma emitting radionuclides are used to demonstrate perfusion defect which indicates absent or decreased blood flow. Two or more segmental perfusion defects indicates a high likelihood of pulmonary embolism. Magnetic resonance imaging with gadolinium contrast may be used for deep vein thrombosis. Magnetic resonance pulmonary angiography may be used for large proximal PE but this is unreliable for small subsegmental pulmonary embolism. The echocardiogram is a poor test for pulmonary thromboembolism and most patients have normal echocardiograms. However, in some patients, hypokinesis of right ventricular free wall with normal or hyperkinetic motion of the right ventricular apex may be seen and this is called the McConnell sign. A saddle thrombus or a thrombus in the right main or left main pulmonary artery can be identified with the echocardiogram. Invasive imaging modalities for diagnosis of PTE include pulmonary angiography which has now been replaced by CTPA, contrast phlebography has now been replaced by venous ultrasound. An integrated diagnostic approach would be to assess the clinical likelihood of DVT and PTE. If the clinical likelihood of DVT is low, then a D-dimer can be done. If this is normal, this rules out deep vein thrombosis. If it is high or the clinical likelihood of DVT is high, then imaging tests would be required. Similarly, if the clinical likelihood of pulmonary thromboembolism is not high, then a D-dimer may be done. A negative test would rule out PTE. A high D-dimer or a high clinical likelihood of pulmonary thromboembolism would require imaging tests. The imaging test of choice, as already discussed, is the chest CT. If it is non-diagnostic, unavailable or safe, lung scanning may be considered. If the lung scanning is not diagnostic, then a venous ultrasound may be done. If this is positive, the patient warrants treatment for PTE given the high clinical likelihood. If the venous ultrasound is negative, the patient can undergo transesophageal echocardiogram, magnetic resonance imaging or invasive pulmonary angiography. The treatment of pulmonary thromboembolism depends upon the clinical condition of the patient. If the patient is normotensive and has a normal right ventricle, then anticoagulation alone or an IVC filter may suffice. If the patient is normotensive but has right ventricular hypokinesis, then the treatment needs to be individualized. If the patient is hypotensive, however, it might require anticoagulation and thrombolysis and may also require embolectomy which may be either catheter directed or surgical. Anticoagulation for venous thromboembolism may be non-warfarin or warfarin based. Options in non-warfarin anticoagulation include unfractionated heparin targeting an APDT of 2-3 to three times the upper limit of normal, enoxaparin, daltiparin, tinzaparin, fondaparinox and direct thrombin inhibitors argatroban and bivalirudin. Other options include rivaroxaban, apixaban, dabigatran, and edoxaban. Warfarin-based anticoagulation requires 5 to 10 days of use for effectiveness as monotherapy. It is usually used after bridging agents, titrating an INR of 2 to 3. Parenteral anticoagulation must be continued for at least 5 days and the usual starting dose of warfarin is 5 mg. Management of massive pulmonary embolism includes cautious volume replacement because excessive fluid administration exacerbates right ventricular wall stress. Dopamine and dobutamine are first-line agents norepinephrine, vasopressin and phenylephrine are second-line agents. Fibrinolysis must be undertaken for massive 
pulmonary embolism because this involves dissolving the anatomically obstructing thrombus, preventing release of neurohormonal agents which worsen pulmonary arterial hypertension and lysing the source of the thrombus. 100 mg of recombinant tissue plasminogen activator as a continuous infusion over 2 hours is given and can be used for at least 14 days after the PTE has occurred. Intracranial disease, recent surgery and trauma are contraindications. Massive pulmonary embolism is the only FDA approved indication for fibrinolysis in PTE. The duration of anticoagulation for provoked venous thromboembolism used to be 3 to 6 months which was the classical teaching. However, after the Einstein choice study, extended periods of anticoagulation may be beneficial. For unprovoked VTE which includes long haul air travel, infinite duration of anticoagulation is required with a target INR between 2 and 3. Prevention of venous thromboembolism in hospitalized patients is an important concept. For patients undergoing high-risk non-orthopedic surgery, unfractionated heparin, enoxaparin or daltiparin may be used. For patients undergoing cancer surgery including gynecologic cancer surgery, enoxaparin may be used. Major orthopedic surgery would require anticoagulation with either warfarin, enoxaparin, daltiparin, fondaparinox, rivaroxaban or intermittent pneumatic compressions with or without pharmacological prophylaxis. Medically ill patients during hospitalization may be given unfractionated heparin, enoxaparin, daltiparin, fondaparinox. Medically ill patients during and after hospitalization may be anticoagulated with petrixaban. In patients in whom anticoagulation is contraindicated, pneumatic compressions may be considered. Other treatment options in pulmonary thromboembolism include the pharmacomechanical catheter-directed therapy wherein physical fragmentation or pulverization of thrombus with catheter-directed low-dose thrombolysis is undertaken. Another option is the pulmonary embolectomy which requires rapid referral and improved surgical technique. 3-5% to of patients with PTE will develop pulmonary arterial hypertension. For them, pulmonary thromboendarterectomy is an option which requires median sternotomy, cardiopulmonary bypass, deep hypothermia and periods of hypothermic circulatory arrest. If the patient is inoperable, pulmonary vasodilator therapy or balloon angioplasty of pulmonary arterial webs may be undertaken. That's it for our presentation on pulmonary thromboembolism. Thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video.